Excellent. So uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Devlin and uh, Dr. Scudieri, uh, the Italian stallion, for, for giving us this opportunity and to be able to talk to you today. Um, I can tell you three things uh, from being at the War College. I am definitely not an expert. I am definitely not a scientist. And I definitely played soccer better when I was 24. <laughs> um, for, yeah, so Dr. Devlin just kind of went over this uh, special operations uh, command north that we, we did our project on. I basically did the operational environment, so I'm just going to give you the quick, hey, this is where and, and why we're doing this. So my next slide. This is the uh, impacts of the, the geography. So if we look at this, and what is this? This is the North Slope Borough, which is the northern part of Alaska. Most people, if you don't know this, Alaska is our biggest state, much bigger than Texas, by the way. Um, and we just concentrated on the very top because that is the part that is actually in the Arctic. It is about 95,000 square miles. Uh, it is mostly tundra, and for those who don't know what tundra means, it's, it's not a vehicle or a truck. It is a treeless area, basically, that is frozen for most of the year. Uh, there are short summers where some of it slightly thaws, but for the most part, it is what we, when we think of the Arctic, it is a frozen area. There's about 10,000 residents uh, that, that live in the, uh, this area, and again, they're mostly local communities. There are a few workers that go up uh, there to, to do certain things, and we'll get more into that. Uh, into my changing environment slide. Okay, yeah, they're, that my, that's our, we are the polar bears, the whole group of us, so I thought this was pretty neat. Um, the polar bear looking back at us going, what the heck's going on here? Um, it is a changing environment. Um, it is due to climate change, right? So over the past 50 years, uh, the Arctic is warming four to seven times faster than anywhere else on the globe. Uh, what does this mean? Why is this important? So when it's warming, uh, of course, the Arctic being mostly ice, it's melting. The, the sea ice is melting, the land ice is melting, the, uh, the permafrost, which is the frozen ground, is thawing. What does this do? It opens up new passages in the seas, um, if you actually look at a globe, it, it actually shortens the trip from, you know, from Alaska or we'll just say North America to Eurasia and Russia, just on the other side there. So it, it is very important that we understand that. As the, uh, the ground thaws, a lot of things have been frozen for thousands of years. They are now, uh, as, the, as it thaws, they're, they're all coming out of the ground, things such as pathogens, viruses, uh, and this stuff called methane gas, um, which... Um, anyways, we won't get into the details of that, just letting you know some of the uh, things that are going on. Uh, into economic concerns. Okay, so this slide is basically just showing you uh, also why the NSP is so important. All those little boxes there show you that we are very, or the NSP is very rich in resources. Uh, lots of uh, oil and gas being the main thing there, but there are mining for rare mineral um, Rare earth minerals, sorry, that, uh, that are becoming very valuable these days, especially when you start thinking about uh, the new batteries and things that are going into vehicles and whatnot. And they're, they're untapped. So when I say untapped, that means as things melt and thaw, they're now becoming accessible. Um, this also leads to opportunities. It's not just vulnerabilities for us, but also it gives uh, folks jobs. The locals can actually get jobs there working at the, uh, these, these type of facilities. Um, hopefully, we'll, they'll get a little bit of tourism up there, whoever wants to see uh, one of those polar bears. Um, uh, but however, it does change their, their way of life. As If they're used to living off the land, um, this is a bit of an interruption when it comes to seal hunting and those types of things. Okay, next slide. And this is, uh, if anybody doesn't know who that is, that is Vladimir Putin. Um, and of course, it's titled Geopolitical Competition. As I was saying, these re it's a very resource-rich resource area. Uh, and with these new passageways, there's a bit of a land grab. And, uh, and of course, uh, there is no actual rule of law to decide who gets what and who goes where. Um, and this guy has got his eyes on it. Um, he is also pos posturing with... Uh, militarization of new infrastructure, uh, just if you didn't know. And, um, and of course, their, their sort of enemy but friend, China, is also uh, helping out with that land grab and sort of claiming certain areas. 
Um, we do have an Arctic Council, um, and hopefully there'll be rules-based uh, international order sooner than later. And that leads into my other slide here, the U.S. Arctic strategy. We do have an Arctic strategy. I won't get into details of it, but the main thing is, is we look at this as a place we need to secure. Uh, it's a place we need to be more resilient, especially with our infrastructure. Uh, when you think about thawing land, it's very unstable and very expensive to, to live out there. Um, and then the, the biggest one, in my opinion, is the partners. Uh, when we look at the whole Arctic, we do touch it. We're a part of it with, uh, with Alaska and, of course, our uh, North American partners there, Canada, but also the Scandinavian countries in Europe. Uh, and we need, they, they already know how to live there. They know what to do. So we need to partner with them and they have a lot of the, the answers. Um, and then into my final slide, we talk about the eight distinct communities of the NSB. You can see they're scattered around mostly on the coast. We have one here in the past. Uh, but they're mainly on the coast, and the reason they're there is, is obviously their lifestyle, living off the sea in that type of area. Um, I'm going to pass to George for the next set of slides. Great, thank, thank you. I don't have. Okay, I guess I have to be really close. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is George Svakinus. Thank you, Rob, for that that great uh, introduction. Um, our next slide will be referring to the military structure supporting the Arctic. Um, this is a very, very complex system, so I don't want you to get caught up in the lines and the boxes and whatnot. More just look at the fact that our research is focused on that um, far right segment, which is SOC North. Um, they, they have to partner with a lot of these agencies, and a lot of these agencies are actually the experts in that area, specifically the National Guard. Um, they, they do a lot of support up there. Um, we need to use those as much as possible. Um, to support SOC North's research, uh, I'm sorry, medical uh, uh, response services there. So our next slide goes into the North Slope Boroughs organizations that are relevant to the, uh, the SOC North mission. Um, right there on the top, you see obviously the North Slope Borough government. Um, that's our local government agency. Then we have a veter veteran affairs shield there. Um, there's a lot of veterans up in that area. So using their former expertise while they were in the military and their current expertise while they're living out there is key. Uh, I'm gonna try this name. My last name is Svakinir, so I can say that. I could probably say Ilisagvik. Yes, I said it right. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so th they, uh, they support, obviously, they're, they're the, uh, the Alaska's tribal college and they support the local area and community with their research. Uh, next, we have Wright Air Service. Wright Air Service is a private entity that we could use to support um, uh, potential search and rescue missions and airlifts if we need them. Uh, next, we have the Ted Stevens Center, which is uh, actually a DOD agency, quasi agency, if you will. It's a research and educational entity dedicated to exploring security concerns in the Arctic. Um, they've done a lot of great research. The DOD does um, use them for as the experts in the area. They, they, they're up there, so no, there's no better person to, to ask for that. And then the last uh, couple here, they're, they're more uh, private entities. So Alaska Sounder is the, uh, the newspaper up there. It is a weekly newspaper. Um, KBRW is the, the top of the world radio. Um, both of these can be used to uh, basically project the message out to, to the, the public. They use that. Um, they also use social media a lot now. Uh, so there's a bit of an issue in terms of um, misinformation and disinformation. Um, so that's something that's very important for SOC North to take advantage of. And lastly, the, uh, the, the Dog Mushers Association. That's in Fairbanks, not quite in the North Slope Borough. But um, we do have experts in dog mushing, which I think we'll be talking a little bit about later on in our logistics uh, portion. Uh, next, we have a few pictures for you. So uh, just to, to show you a couple of pieces of the Inupiat culture, that is the, uh, the, the, the tribe that's in the North Slope Borough. On the top left-hand corner, you'll see the Nalukatak festival, that's the uh, the whaling festival, and that's actually the top left and top right. Um, they are actually dancing in the uh, the, the top left um, by propelling themselves into the air with a, a seal skin. So it's almost like a trampoline. Um, they're having a good old time uh, because they're going to be doing a lot of work uh, on the top right hand side. Uh, as gory as that image is, that's actually a necessity in the uh, Arctic region. Uh, that is probably one of their main food sources. 
Um, that is the whaling festival and it's a communal feasting and sharing where whale meat, blubber, and other traditional fare distributed amongst the community and visitors alike. So probably a good opportunity for Sock North to go in and integrate themselves with the local community. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity to, to understand their culture as well as um, to help them out because this is a lot of work. Uh, bottom right hand side, you have the dancing festival. That's the Kivyuk. Did I say that right, Michelle? Okay, great. <laughs> and that's the Inupiat Dancing Festival. Um, that's obviously where they dance and have fun and, and basically uh, celebrate the uh, their traditions and honor their ancestors. And uh, bottom left-hand side there, that's the Inupiat Heritage Center, uh, where we can learn more about the Inupiat heritage and their customs of the community. So all these are great resources for Sock North to integrate themselves with local community. It's a tight-knit group, so they can't just roll right in and say, hey, we're here to help. Um, it's kind of like when, you know, us as government agencies see the, the Army Audit Agency come in and like, hey, we're here to help. It's like, yeah, right, okay. Um, so <laughs> they, they need to integrate themselves to, to get better um, better response from, from the group. Um, my last slide here, is, and before I drop it off to, uh, to Angie to talk about the medical challenges and recommendations, is our relationships and competition. Um, these are three of many, I'm sure, but um, climate challenges are, are huge in that area. Um, we're adapting to those changes. So Rob talked about the melting permafrost, receding glaciers. You see that that big drop of ice. I mean, if, if somebody's anywhere near that, they're going to have some challenges. So um, Sock North may be called upon to support, along with uh, if they have training exercises or whatnot up there. Um, in terms of the disaster relief assistance, uh, again, collaborating with local communities, that's very important, um, along with the government agencies that we spoke about earlier. Um, th this is us pre-positioning assets um, strategically, personnel, equipment, supplies, and, and also being able to uh, support them as, as the, uh, the mission comes our way. Um, finally, so, uh, search and rescue missions, very important, um, using stuff like, and um, I may be jumping on your boat here talking about the medical aspects, but um, you, you have your UAVs and, I'm oh, sorry, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, that can support it, and, and uh, I'm going to shift over to Angie so she can talk more about that. Thanks, George. All right, so now is the time that we need to be leaning forward to develop credible solutions to tackle challenges to, um, that are going to be facing our medical operations in this environment. During one of our first group meetings, Michelle, Dr. Devlin, spoke about the fact that, you know, the first thing we need to understand about this region is that everything in it is trying to kill us. Right. And since studying this this uh, region and being on this project, you know, I've also learned that act activities in this region require a very bespoke set of skills and equipment to operate effectively. Additionally, everything takes longer in this environment, you know, navigating the terrain, movements in general through multiple layers of clothing. Dexterity is challenged with with gloves. You know, when you remove your gloves, you expose yourself to frostbite. You know, so the list goes on and on. So it's, it's crucial that, that we are getting our sets and reps through training and exercises to be able to improve our ability to operate in this environment. And we also need to be leveraging our partners and our allies during this time frame to be able to, to work on our interoperability together. The, the tyranny of distance, right, is, is a all present challenge in the sense that we can't just go around the corner and, and leverage a hospital or a medical clinic to be able to close the gaps in any resources that we need to be able to operate there. One of the challenges will be blood supply, okay? So, so we have some ideas out there to be able to leverage drones or other unmanned vehicles to be able to deliver blood during the time of need. However, another opportunity exists through, through the walking blood bank. So the walking blood bank is, is, in a, is a program that you can utilize in emergency situations um, where we can identify individuals who, who have that low titer O blood type during the soldier uh, readiness processing timeframes. And we can pre-identify them as potential donors. So during those emergency situations, they can be able to have that just-in-time blood supply for that soldier in those remote areas. So that is definitely an option. Um, evacuation obstacles, oops, sorry, the next slide. Okay. Yep. So <laughs> evacuation obstacles are also ever present, okay, in the sense that, you know, we, we are also having to deal with the 
the um, distance and also the risk of hypothermia, further compounding the challenge. This evacuation sled is currently being designed um, where we can protect individuals from the elements as well as provide real-time vital sign monitoring during transport. Next slide. Personal heating devices are also an area where we need further research and development. This example behind me is something that was designed by Heatpack, and, and this industrial base has since grown cold, okay, because it it's, hasn't been utilized in over a decade. Okay, but this is a system where they can utilize charcoal and a D battery in order to produce heat during the time of need. So we can apply that to a casualty to help further prevent hypothermia. And so these are just some of the few of the challenges that are facing medical operations within this environment. And, but with challenges come great opportunity. And there's numerous opportunities to be able to apply innovative solutions to address these capability gaps within this region and further drive the needle of readiness forward. Thank you. I'll be followed by Kim Smith. Thank you. Logistics in the North Slope Borough is hampered by this tyranny of distance. Alaska is a large state. It's about two and a half times the size of Texas. And so this issue of distance that is a problem in Alaska is also compounded by the low population. Uh, that The low population leads to very little existing infrastructure. And you've seen on previous slides that the North Slope Borough is, is way up in the top third of the state. So a little bit about this pre-existing infrastructure within North Slope Borough. There's only 10 public airfields. And these are not airports like you and I would think of them. These are single runway, no tower airfields. So they have very, very minimal services. They have snow removal and they have lights. So these airfields can't take a, a large amount of unexpected traffic. There's only one permanent road that connects North Slope Borough to the re rest of the Alaska State Highway System, and no roads connect all those communities together. So uh, I, I put a little map up there. On the map, Fairbanks is the star in about the middle of the state, and it is the farthest north that the U.S. has stationed active duty troops. The Arctic Circle doesn't even start until 100 miles north of that star. So, you know, we're talking way up north. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> the, the star on the coastline to the left is Ukavik or Barrow. It's 500 miles by air from Fairbanks. And the star on the right on the coast is Prudhoe Bay, which connects to, to Fairbanks through the Dalton Road. Dalton Road is a 550 mile road that connects to the Alaska state system. The other two pictures are of this Dalton Road. Uh, the Dalton Road is primarily used for commercial vehicles. It connects all those oil and gas companies to the rest of the world. So a lot of big rigs go up and down this road and it's not really a finished road the whole way. A lot of it's gravel. So lots of big roads going up and down, or lots of big rigs going up and down these roads. It creates a lot of dust and reduces visibility, especially in the summer. Now in the winter, of course, you're contending with snow and ice and avalanches. So this is a dangerous road and not an ideal option. And I'm sure you've all heard of ice roads. Um, they, these are temporary roads. Uh, they're, they only last about three months and they're generally privately owned and access controlled because they're very expensive to make and very expensive to maintain. So they're not really an access point for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, options within our area uh, for providing medical resupply and evacuation in North Slope Borough. Uh, up on the far right corner is the Beowulf. It's an amphibious track vehicle, cold weather all-terrain vehicle, Cat V. And since it's amphibious, it can traverse water, but only at about two and a half miles an hour, and can traverse rugged terrain at about 40 miles an hour. It can carry up to 14 people, and there's different versions, so an ambulance version can carry out two non-ambulatory patients when required. The next picture is the dog sled. Uh, the greater number of dogs, the more a sled can pull. So some large teams can carry up to 1,200 pounds and can travel at about 20 miles per hour. These, it's a lot slower option, but it is an option. It was used to carry mail in Alaska up until the 1960s when aircraft took over. 
but currently, uh, that, that's actually a picture of the Danish forces. They are using their serious units, the Dog Star units, uh, for patrol in Greenland. So it, it's not a completely outdated option. And snowmobi snow machines or snowmobiles are often used by the locals. Much faster option at 70 plus miles an hour, but their range is only about 220 miles on a tank of gas. So you can't, you can't stay out long periods of time. Uh, right, no, right bottom, sorry. Yes, uh, unmanned aerial systems. This is a global hawk. It is, with very few airfields available, long range systems are preferred. So I, I chose this particular one because it'll go 34 hours flying and can carry up to 14,000 kilograms. So quite capable of bringing in lots of supplies. And um, the advantage of UAS is it keeps pilots out of harm way harm's way. So, and then the autonomous vehicle, this is a concept vehicle. They of course have flying versions, they have driving versions, and this is a, a future concept. And hopefully in the future, they will be able to do some of these resupplies or uh, evacuate casualties without putting additional humans in harm's way. So right in the center, I put the National Defense Industrial Strategy. And that's just because some of the medical equipment, some of the specialized equipment, some of the things to treat, to keep troops warm, or even the snow machine is considered a commercial off-the-shelf item, a COTS item. And this NDIS showcases COTS efficacy as a sourcing solution. Uh, COTS is not new, but this, this document, which was just put out in November, calls to embrace the COT solution and prioritize it because you know when you're not customizing these supplies and you're buying them off the shelf, you speed acquisition process and it improves our overall supply chain resiliency. Uh, the topic that our team uh, researched was Chinese lawfare in Antarctica. Oh, thank you, got it. <laughs> and the imp implications for the frozen continent. As uh, Dr. Devlin mentioned, our sponsoring agencies included Joint Task Force, Support Forces Antarctica, and the 109th uh, Airlift Wing. The study methods for our research included uh, reviewing secondary sources, as well as meeting with uh, subject matter specialists. Uh, we'd like to thank Colonel uh, Christopher Ford, the Deputy Commander of Joint Task Force, Support Forces Antarctica, for his insight that was helpful in our research. Okay, I'll start with the population. Um, Antarctica uh, actually does not have a, a population, and today it has no conventional <laughs> residents beyond just the rotating staff at 103 of the main Antarctic facilities. Uh, the implications of uh, the climate change and those impacts are significant. Uh, Antarctica is the world's largest and coldest desert, the fifth largest and highest continent on Earth. Uh, the largest uh, glaciers in the uh, world continue to retreat rapidly, and Antarctica continues to lose billions of tons of ice each year. As mentioned, the climate changes is now opening access through routes that haven't been accessed before. The United States has strong diplomatic interests in Antarctica and seeks to promote Antarctica's status as a continent reserved for peace and science in accordance with the provisions of the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. The purpose of the treaty is regulating uh, relations among states in Antarctica. There are four principles outlined in Article I of the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. Peaceful purposes means that it prevents, prohibits any measures of a military nature, such as the establishment of military bases, the carrying out of military maneuvers, as well as the testing of any types of weapons on the continent. For free access of scientific investigation, uh, this is evident through the many and numerous scientific research labs throughout the continent, and this commitment to scientific freedom persists under the treaty's provisions. And finally, the United States does not recognize territorial claims, but other countries do. The map reflects that over time, several countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and Argentina, uh, to name a few, uh, claims, make claims in Antarctica throughout the continent and surrounding seas. These territorial claims have strategic implications 
and that there is overlap with these claims and may impact the future. So before we get into the case studies, we really need to kind of lay the groundwork for what is lawfare or legal warfare. While the concept of lawfare has been around for a few decades, it was first defined for the military purposes in the United States by Major General Charles Dunlop, a now retired Air Force lawyer. In 2001, he defined lawfare as the use or misuse of law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve an operational objective. There have been many scholars that have studied his work since and found that the initial definition was too narrow as it didn't focus on the strategic and tactical objectives as well. Currently, the concept of lawfare is gaining influence in military circles for the US, but it's not yet considered a critical portion of our military capabilities. Most warfare planners focus on not breaking the law during warfare and not how we can best use the law to our advantage. China, on the other hand, has a long history of implementing lawfare into its warfighting plans. In 1963, China established a set of guidelines for the People's Liberation Army known as the Political, or the political Works Department that required the establishment of combat functions for political work known as the Three Warfares. That includes public, warfa uh, public opinion warfare, psychological warfare, and legal warfare to influence audiences both domestically and internationally. In 2006, the PRC, People's Republic of China, released a legal warfare study that said lawfare is a form of combat and will be used to shape the environment for Chinese military or political actions, seize the initiative, and serve as a force multiplier. China's strategy for the implementation of lawfare focuses on joining international organizations to gain influence on how these organizations interpret laws. It attempts to change the laws to benefit China. And when it can't be successful, it will create domestic laws to act as a backstop. In short, China's lawfare strategy is sophisticated, it involves the use of legal activity to support, undermine, or substitute for other forms of combat, so it can argue that it is obeying the laws, criticize its adversaries when they violate the laws, and reinterpret international laws, particularly regarding the sea, space, economic, and cyber domains. So my portion of the case study focused on China's use of lawfare in the economic realm, and it's both internationally and domestically. So first we'll look at the international portions. There are a lot there. I'm gonna cover very, a very small subset of what they're doing economically. So first uh, with the World Trade Organization, they became a member in 2001 and immediately started exercising resistance. If you become a member of the World Trade Organization, you, you are allowed to self-identify where either you're a developing nation or a developed nation. Developing nations get uh, special provisions where the member nations can't really impact your trade agreements, uh, and it provides them um, increased trading opportunities on the uh, global scale. Although China is the second largest global economy, to this day, they still claim developing country status. So they still get that, those benefits. It, it has increased their exports globally from 516 billion a year in 2001 to over $4 trillion a year today including many lucrative trade agreements with Chile, Argentina, and New Zealand, which are all claimants of uh, Antarctic territory. When China is not successful in circumventing these international organizations, it stepped out and created its own international organizations. For uh, initiatives for their Belt and Road Initiative, they tried to get the World Bank to underwrite some of those projects. They uh, got a lot of pushback from the World Bank, so instead of having to go that route, they established the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment uh, Bank to have less scrutiny on its uh, activities as it was trying to fund some of these projects. Through that bank, China has provided funding to multiple ATS uh, uh, territorial climate nations, including about $12 billion of a direct investment into Argentina and $15 billion in investment uh, to Chile without much global oversight. When unable to sway all of these organizations or create its own international ones, it's passed domestic laws to hold nations accountable for actions that it views detrimental to its objectives. This includes passing uh, one of the small ones, or one of the bigger ones was the anti-foreign sanctions law, which is used against multiple countries that are voting members for the Antarctic Treaty system. For Australia, it placed tariffs on barley and wine, cutting about $20 billion annually in trade with Australia because Australia made comments on its human rights violations comments regarding uh, China's ambitions in the South China Sea, and also for it requesting an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. China only lifted these tariffs 
once a less hostile government, in their opinion, was elected in Australia. In Norway, it stopped all salmon imports uh, from Norway into China in retaliation for China or for Norway awarding the Nobel Peace Prize to a Chinese dissident. To appease China and reestablish that trade, Norway declined a meeting between Norway and the Dalai Lama in 2014, and it, it uh, had to issue a public statement in 2016 that acknowledged China's sovereignty and stated that Norway's own actions had been detrimental to the mutual trust between the two countries. In the Philippines, China used domestic laws to limit Filipino agricultural good imports and restricted Chinese tourism to the Philippines after the uh, Philippines had enacted an international tribunal to solve territorial claims in the South China Sea. The sanctions were lifted in 2016 when a change in leadership was uh, for the Philippines ended up being more conciliatory towards China's objectives. After South Korea deployed a U.S. Uh, missile defense system, uh, it suffered curtailed tourism, decreased exports into China, and it, the shuttering of 90 Korean-owned stores in China itself. Trade and tourism was only reestablished after South Korea made a public statement acquiescing um, to some of China's demands and also making a public assurance that it would not expand that missile system. As shown by this small set of examples, China's use of economic lawfare has set a foundation to influence the Antarctic Treaty System voting countries. These nations that would prefer the current treaty system remain in place should be cognizant of Chinese legal uh, economic actions as portions of the treaty system approach a renewal vote in 2048. The continued threat of Chinese economic law lawfare could influence the signatory countries to fundamentally change how the world utilizes Antarctica. Hey, good afternoon. I reviewed China's use of lawfare in the South China Sea. Through the South China Sea, China projects diplomatic, economic, and military influence. In the region, we can see how China undermines norms, agreements, and access. We should expect to see China use these tactics in other global common spaces, namely Antarctica. China's 3,000-year-old history has much to do with how it sees itself and its perspective on the world order. It has a national purpose shaped by Confucian tradition, which gives it perceptions of internal peace and order. However, the century of humiliation, which stifled their influence as the Middle Kingdom, factors into Chinese motivations to grow into a global influence. The South China Sea supports approximately one-third of global commerce annually, totaling a uh, nearly $3.5 trillion in goods. Within the region, nations rely on the trove of natural resources, including untapped hydrocarbons under the sea floor and the vast fishery within the waters. China sees itself as something of a global underdog whose power, concerns, and influence should be recognized and respected by the international community. This attitude comes to odds with global norms and the rule of law. These controls are generally formed through consensus of multiple partners, of varying power classes, and essentially Western liberal democratic ideals. To China, size and power is all that matters. China sees itself as the great East Asian power because of its population size, economic, and military power. Therefore, it sees it appropriate that it should impose its will on South China Sea nations, especially those adjacent to the Nine Dash Line. You see up there that map. The nine dash line is China's greatest assertion of power, and it claims around 90% of the South China Sea for its own. This expansion demarcation serves not only as an assertion of sovereignty, but also as the cornerstone of China's lawfare operations in the region. Within the nine dash line, China overtakes globally recognized exclusive economic zones of several nations. China places fishing restrictions in adjacent waters, citing environmental conservation efforts. And China creates domestic laws to justify its action, though its actions are generally in violation of the law of the sea and other international law. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, outlines maritime claims and defines and clarifies various maritime zones. Each zone carries specific implications for a country's access and travel rights, and these definitions are generally applied globally without contest. However, in the South China Sea, EEZs, as they're commonly referred to, are a point of contention as the nine dash line absorbs countries' EEZs. UNCLOS further outlines how nations can seek resolution 
for claim disputes through the international legal system. China denounced this legal process, deeming court rulings null and void after the nine dash line was found to have no legal basis. China uses lawfare in the South China Sea as a, main, as a means to gain full access to sea routes and resources. This behavior undermines global norms recognized by all other regional countries and nearly all other sea and ocean bordering nations around the globe. We should expect to see China increasing activity in Antarctica for scientific purposes, but we should also expect to see China expand pressure and influence economically and mil militarily in Antarctica. All right, I apologize. As I look around the room, we took a lot of the way, uh, a lot of the smiles that we had up here when we had uh, puppies up on the screen. But um, as I talk about our Antarctic, I'll focus more on the competition realm as well with the Chinese lawfare activities in that region. So in 2012, the Chinese leadership made a claim that China is a near Arctic state. They're using this in line with their three warfares principles of public warfare. Uh, to exert their claims and their rightful influence in the Arctic region. Along with that, China's made, made the statement more recently that they strive to be a great polar power. Chinese leadership has also made statements that since they're one-fifth of the world's population, that they have the right to 20% of the resources in the Arctic. So Chinese messaging is very different in the Arctic than in the South China Sea. Where in the South China Sea, President Xi has stated that Asian problems should be solved by Asian nations. China's jockeying for influence in the Arctic while uh, unaccording to the, the desires of the local states in the Arctic region. In 2013, the PRC was admitted in the Arctic Council as an observer state, and they're using that along with other terms of lawfare to gain influence in the decision-making process for how the Arctic will be governed in the future. As Rob said earlier, the Arctic is warming at four to seven times the rate of other regions on the planet. And with that, the uh, retreating sea ice is providing access to regions that used to be encased in ice. So in his, by as early as 2030, for up to four months each summer, the Arctic Sea could be free of ice. So this is opening up, uh, as the gentleman mentioned the, in the audience, the Northwest Passage through the Northern Canadian Islands, two additional sea routes through the Arctic Ocean. That's the Transpolar Sea Route, direct from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, as well as the Northern Sea Route, which goes along the northern border of Russia. In addition to the sea routes, experts estimate that up to 13% of the world's undiscovered oil and 30% of the world's undiscovered rare earth minerals are located in the Arctic region. So these open up new challenges, this access to unclosed claims and sovereignty claims of the, of the countries in the region as well as the influence by external countries such as China. So the increased PRC activities in the Arctic coupled with the climate change in the region are creating a reinforcing loop where the physical change coupled with geopolitical tension continue to build on each other and make it a more tense environment. To gain access to these regions, as we talked about the icebreakers in the Russian fleet, the Chinese have also started to invest in their icebreaker fleet with the uh, Shui Long series of icebreakers. The first one was actually bought from Ukraine in 2014, and China launched their first indigenously produced icebreaker, the Shui Long II, just last year, with future plans of creating more icebreakers to include nuclear-powered ships and massive conventional-powered icebreakers. The PRC's attempts to gain access through other Arctic nations uh, have brought a mixed results out there. So, one of the strategic reasons for the Arctic is from that point, you can see a large portion of space, and that's the region around the, the uh, equator where our satellites are orbited. So with control of Arctic areas coupled with the Antarctic, as we researched, if they have control of those areas, they can control and have a direct access link to the satellites orbiting around the equator. So the PRC was successful in opening their first overseas space station with uh, Sweden, but as some of their economic lawfare and uh, other coercion efforts, some of the uh, countries in the Arctic have started to disallow Chinese investments in the region, both for space stations, uh, mineral access, mine building, and other things of the nature. But since the international sanctions were placed on Russia following their illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the following uh, invasion of Ukraine in 2022, 
those sanctions have forced Russia to become more reliant on China. And China has taken advantage of that Russian reliance by incorporating ways to gain access to the Arctic through Russia. So overall, as we've looked at through these case studies, we should continue to examine the PRC activities of lawfare in these different regions of the world to see how that can improve our historical mindedness and provide possible actions that the PRC could be taking in Antarctica. All right, and so here's something if, uh, as you guys think about questions, if you guys can help us out a little bit too, of providing some recommendations, here's some of the things that we've thought about through our lessons learned of these strategic activities that are uh, incorporated through the rest of the world and how they could be applied in Antarctica and some recommendations that we've made ourselves. So we've broken these up into the national level and the military level. At the national level, as Ina mentioned earlier, the Department of the State administers the, the Antarctic policy through the National Science Foundation. That does not create a good whole of government solution solving process to the challenges we have in Antarctica. So we believe the Department of State should review that where the Antarctic policy is implemented and managed and likely bring that up to a Department of State level to create better whole of government solutions uh, responding to challenges in Antarctica. Additionally, as they look at it, we can't look at the simplistic terms of DIME, uh, the DIME model of diplomacy, information, military, and economics. We need to expand that to see that uh, what our, what our adversaries and our challengers are doing in the region and expand that to uh, think about finance, intelligence, and how we can apply legal power as a national instrument of power in the region. Uh, we certainly can improve our coalition partnerships there. One of the challenges there is the inspections of, of these uh, research facilities in Antarctica. So if we can have a coalition help out with the inspection series there to ensure uh, limited dual use military solutions by the Chinese, then also we can, we can team up to help protect some of the environmental protection acts there, such as the maritime protection areas and fisheries enforcement and illegal fishing and resource harvesting in Antarctica. At our military level, currently the Antarctic continent is under the purview of Indo-PACOM or the Indo-Pacific Command. Indo-Pacific Command is the largest command in the United States and uh, focuses on competition with China and being prepared for conflict with China. We think transferring the uh, responsibility of Antarctica to SOUTHCOM or so the Southern Command would align more with their responsibilities of countering and competing with China while focusing less on the competition piece of it. Additionally, we can apply a broader perspective of lawfare in our PME, our professional military education programs, and include it as one of our options uh, in our combatant commander plans, such as a flexible deterrent option of involving lawfare uh, techniques. And finally, as uh, we've talked about a little bit already, the, uh, the icebreaker process, we have been authorized for uh, six additional icebreakers for the US. Uh, our two that we have right now were built in the 1970s and they're on service life extensions at this point, so they're gonna go away. Uh, but we've only been appropriated funds to build four of those icebreakers in the future. Additionally, uh, to, uh, as a little bit of a shout out to one of our sponsors, the LC-130 ski equipped aircraft that they fly were also built in the 1970s and are on their service life extensions. We need to be able to invest more to the, so that we can provide access to, uh, to these regions, both Antarctica and in the Arctic region as well. All right, at this time, I'll open it up to any questions or uh, some help with the recommendations that we can provide for uh, in our paper here as we go forward. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Michelle. So, so uh, first off, we are absolutely 100% aware we are the third group of three groups. Um, so I will allocate 30 seconds of my time if y'all need to do jumping jacks or push-ups just to stay awake for this presentation. All right, no, no takers. Okay, that's fine. The uh, so you know we'll go as, as you can tell. There's there's quite a few people um, that are that are also involved onto this topic just because we're we're a little bit different in our group and who we're sponsored by and how we're sponsored. But I also like to think that, you know, when you're not talking about the Arctic and you're not talking about ice and you're not talking about polar bears and miserable environments, and you say something like, hey, who wants to research the Pacific? Um, you got a lot more kernels who jump on that one because maybe Michelle might send us out there and we get to do, you know, palm trees, nice weather, and, uh, and a little bit of uh, blue water. Um, 
but in all seriousness, uh, it is a great team and a great team of academics and a great team of professors all the way across. Uh, and, and we have been um, looking at this from a broader scale. Quaj is, Quajaline, are, are, are the atolls and the Marshall Island is our main focus. Um, but what we've been directly asked to do is, is kind of look at this from a, from a global perspective. So if we could take what we're trying to figure out um, here and apply it to other islands or other military installations that's dealing with things like um, natural disasters or, or rising waters um, or, or those type of environments, how would we apply a same type of structure or model to? So that's, that's what we've been, been asked specifically for workers uh, in this case, but we're trying to broaden our scope. So uh, if you were like, well, first off, let me give you the bottom line up front. So the, because we are group three of three, and I figured you'd only look at one slide, the rest are mostly pictures. Okay, so this is pretty much what we're gonna talk about here. So environmental changes direct human activities, and human activities direct environmental changes. Um, that's kind of what we're, we're seeing from this. Migration, um, as we have talked about migration from wars, we've talked about migration from uh, cultural and conflicts uh, that are happening in regions, we're starting to see something new that is, is, is migration due to environmental factors. And they're occurring faster than we actually thought were possible. And what we're actually declassifying most migrations um, as conflicts or as starvation or as whatever, but they're really environmental reasons. Um, and we haven't actually seen that before and we didn't have a classification to, to view that before. So that's part of the, part of the problem uh, that we, we're starting to identify is recategorizing re some of these classifications uh, of migrations due to environmental changes to bring more forefront the problem. Um, so we were specifically asked for the Kwajalein Atoll um, because it is a critical interest and relies on support for the workforce that's both legally um, and, and to be able to support a, a, an area and a geographical people. Um, and we'll get to why that's strategically important to us as well. It's a lot like the Arctic. It's on the equator. Um, it does very specific things for our national interest um, and, our, and our securities within our environment. So it, it must be maintained. Um, and we have some limitations on what we can maintain it with. And then the last thing is environmental changes. These environmental changes we're talking about all the way out in the Pacific, it affects you here in the United States. It's because these migrations and some of the things that we do is not just going to our mega cities, but they're going to our rural cities as well because we do have responsibility to some of these people to actually uh, provide uh, travel, health, jobs. Um, so you're gonna see effects of this and these cultures and these people here in the United States on your doorsteps um, as we go on. So. So most of you, if, uh, you know, I was talking to Quaj to a couple of people that I know from back home, um, and the first thing, I'm talking for five minutes, I'm passionate about it, I'm going all on, in on Kwajalein, 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 and they finally look at me and say, what, where is Kwajalein? Uh, so you know, I decided for you guys, you know, you're probably a lot more educated than most of my friends back home in Louisiana, and you know where Kwajalein is, but I just went ahead and put that up there, okay? Kwajalein, um, the Marshall Islands uh, out in the Pacific, Kwajalein is, is one of uh, a nation of, of uh, the Marshall Islands is a nation, is, is an independent nation um, in Western Pacific. It's strategically positioned right uh, near the uh, equator and it's flanked by, as we talked about before, Hawaii and Australia. It composes of five islands. Uh, it's 29 coral reef atolls, which if you know anything about coral reefs and atolls, they are very difficult um, to deal with from uh, an environmental perspective. You can't just dig around them. Um, there's a lot of environmental reasons why you can't dig around corals um, to prop an island back up as it starts to sink. With a total land uh, area comparable to about Washington, D.C. Um, has a population, the entire Marshall Islands, about 72,000, uh, and they're predominantly of the Micronesian, Micronesian ethnicity. So think their, their values, their core values are, are tr traditionally family and religion, hospitality. Um, and then their, their main um, food and resource and culture uh, thrives around farming and fishing. So why, why do we as America care about this small, you know, eight mile, uh, 72,000 person? Well, since post-World War II, the Marshall Islands were under U.S. occupation. Um, during the Cold War, uh, because, of the, um, because of the threat of the, the Soviet Union, the U.S. military conducted 67 hydrogen bomb tests uh, in this area right off of Ibai. The island gained independence in 1979, and following this, because of their independence and no more occupation, the U.S. provided reparations for these nuclear damages 
uh, through in 1980 through a compact of free uh, association. We call it a COFA. You'll hear a COFA here for here on out. Um, this allows the Marshallese to work and travel freely from there to the United States. Uh, so they can do so without visas. They can do so with specialty visas uh, back and forth. A lot of this is because of health reasons. Um, so they're, they're entitled to health, uh, health facilities here in the United States because of, uh, because of this um, and this factor. So the why, why, so let's talk about the environmental factor. This island um, is only 10 feet above sea level. Um, so you see all the way out in the middle of the Pacific and 10 feet above the sea level, okay? They're very vulnerable to climate change. I don't know if anybody saw uh, on the news, what about three weeks ago, Michelle, four weeks ago, I don't know if you I guess, um, but a, a rogue wave um, hit, uh, hit this very specific um, island. And if you haven't seen it, um, I, I encourage you to Google uh, Kwajalein. You can take a picture on it because it's hard to spell. Um, but Google it, and, and you'll see a rogue wave that came onto the island, came onto the military installation on the island, um, actually hit the defect, and this wave blew the doors completely open into the defect, and it's caused millions of dollars worth of damage on the installation. Um, and that's a military installation that has higher standards than most of the island does uh, where people live. Um, so, so, so we're seeing not so much of the rising waters that we expect to, 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 for it to be underwater in the next 25 years, um, but the natural disasters are having much more effect um, as it happens um, uh, quite frequently. So rising sea levels, uh, a little science lesson. Um, does anybody know why the, the, the sea levels are rising? Is it because everything's melting? Yeah, that's one reason, but here's another science lesson for you. And I got a, I got a sixth grader and I told him this and he's like, yeah, dad, I know this. The, uh, but the, when, when water temperature rises, what does water do? It expands. So in this specific area, right in the middle around the equator, has been the largest amount of uh, seawater rise, uh, temperature rise um, in the last five to 15 year, 15 to 15 to 20 years. Um, it's has seen it uh, almost triple uh, in, as far as its rate of, 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 of expansion. So because of that, the water is expanding uh, and the water is expanding and is rising. That with the um, ice cap melt, um, so that expansion is about a third of the reason why, these, why, these, uh, why this is happening. Um, so, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. So, when you, when you look at this, what does it matter? Um, and these, these is bottom line. So, I told you they're a fishing village. I told you they're a farming village. Well, when, sea rise, uh, when sea rises, natural disasters occur, it breaks down their infrastructure, okay? So, they can no longer farm. That's, that's their farming. It's in, it's in bins from soil that's brought in. Um, because their soil is now uh, polluted in salt, uh, with salt. Their drinking water is corrupted because their well systems are, are eroded um, and it's been infested with salt, okay? Um, so when you combine that uh, where, and you have a COPA agreement that says they can get to the United States, um, then the first thing they're going to do is they're going to migrate. They're going to get out. So they do have strong cultural factors and they want to keep um, their culture, they want to keep their islands. So what we're seeing is we're seeing they're migrating to the United States, setting up here, working in jobs, and every chance they get, they fly back um, to maintain their culture. So we're seeing a lot of migration going back and forth uh, between both, trying to maintain a culture um, and save a sinking ship in every, in every sense of the word. So I'll be followed by Jen Noor. Hey, so I think John just briefed all my stuff for me, so we're good to go here. Uh, but I was just going to talk about kind of some of those environmental security issues that are impacting all of the Marshall Islands overall. And what I have up here, these are not all of them, but these are some of the United Nations Command, how they kind of have lumped environmental security issues. Um, and I'll talk about kind of the ones that are hitting, I think John hit on most of them, a lot of them, and Damon um, and Hugh will talk about some of the other ones. But th these guys are on the front lines, like John said. They're seeing it every day, um, and that's why they're migrating off the island. So I'll quickly go over some of these. So first, they're seeing extreme weather events and disasters. Um, these are increasing in frequency, and some of the islands will actually be underwater for I think one or two days out of the year, they're actually, some of them are totally submerged. 
Um, so they're seeing an increase in the nat nat natural disasters to inclu include road rogue waves, like John just said, or a king wave, as some people call them. Um, and when that happens, um, it creates a humanitarian issue. And right now, what they learned on the last time, it was the US military responding to help out um, the Marshall Islands, you know, get past the rogue wave that hit. Um, it also impacts the livelihood, insecurity, and migration, as John talked about. Um, they're starting to migrate, and they're migrating um, to Hawaii, um, Arkansas, Iowa, from where I'm from. Um, so they're kind of, they're all over. Um, and then with the sea level rise and the coastal degradation, Damon and Hugh are going to hit on a lot of those engineering pieces. Um, and some of the suggestions that we'll talk about that um, the nation could probably implement. And then um, local resource competition and resource scarcity. So the rising temperature, the erratic precipitation patterns, um, and all of that, the sea level rise that John talked about, um, and his great plus equals slide is, is kind of the so what of it all. It's creating um, insecurity for water, insecurity for food. They can't grow their food. It's such a small like, island nation anyways. Like, could you imagine living there and growing your own food? But on certain days, you don't even know if you're gonna have drinking water on that day because all of your wells are polluted and contaminated. Um, so we've actually had to, the military has actually had to bring in reverse osmosis water purification units to help them purify water. Um, so they have potable water that they can use on a daily basis because life isn't always easy out there. Um, so there is a competition for local resources um, and resources are scarce. Um, and then the next one is the food um, prices and volatility. Everything that goes to these island nations, most of it is getting shipped in because they obviously aren't growing a lot of their food. So they're reliant on shipments of food. Their, their grocery stores don't always have fresh produce. Um, so the island nation has started to actually eat more canned food. Um, they don't have their fishing waters or they've had to go out farther to find the fish that they need. Um, so they're really, it's causing a lot of issues. Um, with regards to you know provisions being available mm -hmm. on the island for them. And so all of these things kind of together are causing them to migrate and leave the island. And John's slide was, I think, next, but it's a good hint. So environmental issues plus you know the degradation of the soil, lack of food, lack of water are creating people to migrate. And that's actually a one of the churches in Iowa where I'm from. So that's where they're migrating to. And a nice cornfield, because if you know, that's where the tall corn grows is in Iowa. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Damon. All right, thank you. thanks, Jen. Okay, so obviously we've talked about the the, the disaster that we see uh, going on in Quaj, but, but you have to be asking yourself, well, why, do, why Quaj? Why is Quaj important to us, right? So from a strategic standpoint, and you know, John already kind of talked about that it's history to the nuclear program. But if you look at it, one of the biggest things we have out there is our missile defense testing. So the, the U.S. Army garrison at, at Quaj ha, operates the Ronald Reagan ballistic missile uh, defense site. It's one of the most advanced missile defense uh, facilities in the world. And the site allows the United States to conduct critical testing of missile defense systems, including our interceptors and sensors. In a, in a very controlled environment. And so you can see a picture behind me, the top picture is, is that Ronald Reagan test site. Um, but you can also see one of the things that, also, that we also launched out of there, uh, the SpaceX Falcon launch in, the, in the, the bottom left picture there. So as you, look, as you look further, you know, Kwajalein is, 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 as you remember from the first picture, is so far out in the Pacific. It is, it is situated, in, in a very strategic vantage point, right? Uh, it's for monitoring and responding to potential threats in the region. Uh, its location allows for the observation and tracking of missile launches, as well as other activities in the Pacific region. If you look at the bottom right picture, what you see there, um, let's see if I can use the laser here without shooting myself. With this thing. There we go. So if, if Kwajalein is over here, 
in Alaska is way over here. And our interceptor missiles are located here in California. Kwajalein has one of the very first, is in a position to see missile launches first uh, out of China or out of North Korea. And so they are, your, they are the tip of the spear. They are the ones that are, that are able to, to sense bad things happening in the Pacific ahead of anybody else. And so we have some of our most advanced uh, sensor systems out there. So those in conjunction with the ones up in Alaska, where we talked about earlier, where you can see all the way down to the equator, those in conjunction can then tie together with our interceptor missiles to, to help with our ballistic missile defense of the United States. Um, so with all this technology out there, it also gives us a op great opportunity for the, the, those facilities out at Quaj um, to, for the United States to conduct research and development activities related to missile defense. So these contributions to advance the US, US military's capabilities uh, and maintain our, our is, is key to maintain our technological edge in an evolving security environment. And so also, as we also sit at the tip of the spear in Kwajalein, it's regional, it adds to the regional stability. Uh, by deterring potential adversaries and providing security assurances to US allies and partners out in the Pacific. Again, we're out there with you. We're out there at the very, very tip of where, uh, of where our enemy can see us. And it, it demonstrates the US commitment to the defense of its interests. And then finally, as we kind of talked about, as, as Jen kind of talked about, this gives us an opportunity for collaborative partnerships. We talk about you know, what are we doing with the, with the Republic of, Mar of the Marshall Islands, you know, our opportunity to partner with that country, uh, whether it's through reverse, uh, providing drinking water or job opportunities or uh, through the COFA agreement to bring folks to the, back to the mainland uh, United States for medical treatments. All of those are great collaborative partnerships that we can, that we can, that we are able to accomplish out there. And so, so then as you look at the workforce there in Kwajalein, it's interesting, you know, you have this great, very important uh, army garrison out there that's only authorized 62 military and Department of the Army civilians, 62 people to run all of this that's out there. Not possible, right? So the reality is the, the, the preponderance of the folks that work out there uh, are contracted through LogCap, which is our logistics civil augmentation program, which provides for contingency support to augment the Army force structure. So in order for Quajalein to operate, there's 1,500, roughly 1,500 contractors out there in, the, on, in Kwajalein. About 1,000 of those are Marshallese nationals, Marshallese local nationals, which leaves about almost 500 expats and then a few other country nationals that are there. That's what operates Kwajalein. So with the preponderance of the, of the workforce being, uh, being Marshallese, they they serve as the unskilled labor primarily, uh, performing roles such as grounds maintenance, janitorial services, infrastructure and housing maintenance, sanitation, running the AFES and the MWRs, and all of those sorts of necessary uh, jobs to, to keep the facility running. But part of the challenge though, is these low-skilled these low tasks, although are very, very much necessary to, to, for the existence of the garrison, their nature also makes them makes them easy to fill, but can also foster a, a transient workforce. Um, and so that, that becomes a challenge of trying to keep a workforce there. So additionally, one of the other challenges, and you ask, well, why is, this, why is there a, a boat? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it a boat, it's not a ship. It's, or you can call it a ferry, is probably the better way to put it. Um, with only a few exceptions of those who have quarters on the garrison, most of the Marshallese workforce have to commute daily from local Ibai on a ferry this ferry. You probably can't see it, but you can see that it's gray. And on the very front of it, it does say US Army. So this is obviously a logistical strain for fuel and, and boats in a resource constrained environment, um, which makes you know, making this daily trip for consistent, you know, but making this daily trip you know, does allow for consistent paying jobs in an already challenged economy, right? So you're talking about all the challenges of trying to keep a workforce out there, um, low skilled, requirements, you've got a ferry every day to get, get back and forth to work. Um, so as we already, and, 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 and then ag aggravated by what Jen and John have already talked about, uh, out migration due to some of the, due to, a, a, uh, due to job opportunities, 
basically impacted by the climate change. So you find that the that many of these Marshallese uh, that are lower educated, um, lower opportunities, they are seeking those less you know they're seeking jobs in in less impacted areas, often filling you know, you know severe labor shortages in the fields where like such as meat packing plants in the Midwest. But these you know basically because of the lower lower literacy rates and education levels uh, there in the Marshall Islands. So again, all of these challenge the U.S. Army garrison Kwajalein for maintaining a viable workforce now and into the future. I'll pass it over to Hugh. All right, thank you. Um, so as John originally uh, said in his introduction, one of the aspects that we were asked to look at is how can we take the results or the effects that are being seen on Kwajalein and expand it to understand how these effects might affect other Department of Defense installations, right? And so I'll make a couple of comments here before I, I get into my slide. So in 2018, some of you may remember the hurricane that went through Tyndall Air Force Base. On one, the day that it hit Tyndall Air Force Base, it was a Category 5 hurricane, right? The day before, it was a Category 2 hurricane. So people say, well, we, yes, we've always had hurricanes in our history. And that's a, that's a true statement, obviously. But what we need to understand is the, the accepted scientific um, data points us towards is the expansion of the hurricane season itself and the, intens and the intensification of the hurricanes themselves, right? So back to Tyndall Air Force Base, $5.2 billion in damage, right? And as some of you know, we are literally reconstructing Tyndall Air Force Base, and it has not com been completed to this day. That same year, uh, Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune was wiped out, or not wiped out, but, but suffered a billion dollars in damages. And as you know, Camp Lejeune is our East Coast Marine Corps uh, power projection platform. Right? Beale Air Force Base is, is, is regularly shut down now. Our operations are impacted by wildfires that affect visibility and landing operations at Beale Air Force Base. If you know Beale Air Force Base, you know we have reconnaissance aircraft there. Okay. And then in 2019, Offutt Air Force Base, which is the home of U.S. Strategic Command, uh, suffered significant flooding damage that shut down a runway, suffered a billion dollars worth of damage. And oh, by the way, Offutt is, again, home to our U.S. Strategic Command, okay? This is, our, this is the National Combatant Command that has oversight over our nuclear weapons, okay? So climate change is, is a significant thing for the Department of Defense. Now, what we've done is kind of looked at Kwajalein specifically, um, but as part of that process, we did look into these overall effects, right? And so as Damon pointed out, the, the Kwajalein workforce has been leaving or is in the process of out-migrating, and yet we rely upon, I say we, the United States, rely on the operation of one of our most strategically important installations to a population that is extremely vulnerable to climate change, okay? So that's, that's why we're gonna talk. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about is what are some of those engineering problems that this population faces that causes that out-migration? So you have a little bit of fidelity on that. Uh, above my shoulder, you actually see a picture of that uh, dining facility that was hit. Um, and so I, I haven't shared this with my colleagues yet, but a, but a person, I, a scientist I know told me that is called a sneaker wave, right? Rogue waves are out in the middle of the ocean Sneaker waves actually hit the shore, um, so that's technically a sneaker wave. It was uh, when it hit the imp when you can see that you can see the height. That's the you know the middle of the window of a dining facility. That's when uh, that's how tall it was, and it went through uh, and impact that dining facility. And oh by the way, um, that was on the island called Roy Namur. It's in the Kwajalein Atoll, but it's an island called Roy Namur, and it's where we have significant monitoring assets uh, to to track our missile defense testing, okay? Um, and one thing I will also add, we just invested another one and a half billion dollars into Kwajalein, something called the Space Fence, okay? The Space Fence gives the U.S. Space Command the ability to monitor a marble in low Earth orbit, okay? So if you can imagine if our friends and competitors are putting things out there in the space domain, what Kwajalein gives us now the ability is to monitor what they're putting up there. Okay, that's why this is important to us. But anyway, so as, as John talked about, rising temperatures causes the oceans actually to, to, to rise. And then you add on top of that the intensification of the storms that are out in the Pacific. Now that's why you will see these overwash, we call them overwash events, right? Uh, they become very significant. Um, saltwater intrusion, John has pointed out, um, 
they actually have aquifers in these islands where they draw the fresh water from. And if you, as you know, fresh water floats on top of salt water, right? But as the salt water intrudes in that, the fresh water is displaced and they can't utilize it for their drinking purposes or agricultural purposes. Freshwater generation, as we talked about, there's just there's very limited ability on those islands to generate fresh water. Uh, most of it depends upon these reverse osmosis units uh, that, that Jin described. Um, again, they're mechanical. Oh, by the way, Kwajalein's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's one of the most corrosive environments that you could put a piece of machinery into. Um, the distribution system itself is dated uh, and, 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 and is um, prone to failure. There are days when these, when the Marshallese will go without actual potable water. They have to live on what is they already have in their in their houses, cisterns or whatever other collection devices. Uh, what you see behind me at the bottom in the bottom corner there is actually one of their rainwater collection areas, um, and that's what they use for their rainwater or, or, or fresh water. They'll obviously they'll, they'll run through a system to clean to clean it. Um, but if salt water is overwashing and getting into that collection area, the water becomes useless. Okay. Coastal erosion, as you can imagine, and you've seen the pictures, it, that's a significant problem. As the water rises, the, the, the waves are stronger, it erodes their land. It's, it's a very simple thing. And then agriculture, as Jen has pointed out, there is really very little usable soil now in, in, in the Marshall Islands. You know, potential solutions might be. Um, uh, and I forgot the name for it now, but you see the, the vertical farming, right? Where they're, where they're, keep, where they're just keeping the roots uh, uh, with nutrition. There are some problems out there, but the bottom line is the climate change impacts are having impacts on the population of Kwajalein Atoll, the Marshall Islands. And we do care because of the strategic importance of that, of, of what we have there and what we will continue to have there. Um, so but at this point, I'll turn it back over to Damon. Uh, to talk about maybe some of the things. That All right, so I'm not going to go down the laundry list of things, but what I will say is we are these are we are still considering recommendations, and these are some of the ones that we've come up with to address the workforce challenges at Quaj. With the preponderance of the workers being Marshallese, many of these options are we try to address the the out stem, the, the stemming out uh, is basically it looks to address the out migration, but we are looking at other workforce options, as well as mitigating the impacts of climate change uh, on the islands. So in order to do this, we looked at short, mid, and long-term goals. So some of our long-term options, or sorry, so short-term options, many of these options are low cost, quick impact. Many are focused on the quality of life of the Marshallese and try to keep them in the region. Our mid-range options kind of look at focuses, uh, they, they look at contracting and infrastructure improvements uh, to improve quality of life. But long-term options, and I think unfortunately, I think as we talk about the reality of things, we, we are probably past the tipping point of trying to uh, to stop sea level rise. And so long, some of the long-term options, we acknowledge sort of loss of, man, of land mass. And so we look at options to relocate vital functions in jeopardy uh, to other areas that are less likely to be impacted by climate change or replace people with technology uh, that can do the functions and require less life support. 